Okay, so let's get started. So we have Monica talking about tech algebra. I think there's still some people in the restrooms and stuff, but you guys can fill them in. So thanks very much to the organizers, and it's nice to be in here. So my eventual goal. And the belief is to talk about uh, double affine Hecke algebras and their representation theory, or a small piece of the representation theory. And, well, the idea, it's a lot to just jump into. So before you get to double affine Hecke algebras, you have to get to know and love affine Hecke algebras and their representation theory. And then you really just have to start with Hecke. So today I'm really starting and even before that, I'm starting with the symmetric group. And so a lot of that is really basic, but if you do it in the right way, then as you move down the line and fill in all the words, it's sort of easier to follow what's going on. And another thing that's going to make it easier to follow what's going on is that everything I'm doing is type A, even type GL. Uh, and that's because there's, uh, that's the stuff I know best, and then you get wonderful combinatorics. Out, and not everything works so well in other types, but certainly a lot of the definitions are there. And so I guess part of my goal is that, you know, we'll sort of understand what the double affine heck algebra is and what it looks like and how to compute with it and with its modules, which means getting very hands-on and kind of generational issues. And that's kind of like how I like to do math. Um, so it might get a little too detailed for people. But you can give me feedback on that. Um, okay. But so to begin with, while I'm talking about um, you know Hecke algebras and stuff, in the symmetric group, I want to talk a little bit about where it's sort of the nature as well before we get to the double F and Hecke algebra. Okay. So um, all right. So reminder. So if I write W, most of the time I'm getting in the symmetric group. And I often use just a funky S for that because there's so many S's in everything I do. But, you know, I mean, right, bounds of type A n minus 1. And, right, my favorite presence, you know, we mostly think of it as being a coxeter group, right, which is generated with simple reflections f i. And we have our relations, which we have a quadratic relation. And we have braid relations. And of course, if you were in type A, you might have type B relations and so on. Right? So your quadratic relation is that you square each of these and you get the identity. So it's a simple reflection. Okay. And um, of course, we model this with just thinking that we're swapping i and i plus 1, and we can even draw pictures that go with it. And it's I and I plus one. And this drawing of the picture uh, is going to be really helpful to do. Okay, because even we're going to be able to even draw a picture to get us through and understand what's going on with the double F and half out of that. Okay. So um, now, of course, if I'm not just talking about the group, if I'm talking about a group algebra, then that lets me actually rewrite this relation as factoring SI minus 1 times SI plus 1 being 0. And of course, we are not going to just talk about the group. We're going to have a some coefficients that we're going to be talking about over K algebra over, or F algebra over some field F. And I'm just going to call it F and not really pin it down because we're going to need various things from F. Um, and some people even think it's me to bring that. But for representation theory, it's really nice to work over a field. Okay. Um, and so again, I know I've, uh, most people probably know this, but I'm just doing it slowly because then we're going to ramp it up eventually. And then your braid relations, right, are that, well, if transpositions aren't adjacent, they commute. I'm going to just write it. subscript is far apart and it's not 
S-I-S-K-S-I, S-K, I'm using a K and an I instead of an I and a J because my I's and J's look a lot alike. And it's plus and minus one, and um, you know, within such so you know what they are. Okay. And I prefer to write my braid relations as so. You might see some people would instead write it as S I S K the M being one, where when K equals I, you let M be one. When K and I are far apart, you let M be two. And when I and K are close together, you let M be three. But why did I not write it that way? Well, because you do want to think of, if I write down all the way at the bottom, can you see? Nope, nope. Okay, so I'll write down all the way at the bottom. Um, right, I want to think to myself of the symmetric group or the quotient of the braid group. And when you think about the braid group, you don't want to put in a relation like so. You want to put in a relation like so, that a product of elements is a product of elements, not saying that you have a bunch of finite order. Okay. And so the braid group, there's not wide agreement on what we'll call its generator. Today I'm calling them G's, but I might forget that later on. Uh, and all you have are the braid relations. You don't have the quadratic relation at all. Okay. And again, we should, um, so if SI was written here, GI I might write right, like so. That's an, actually an over process. Okay. And then, you know, when you write this, if you do SI twice, Right. If you do SI twice, you just draw in the picture, and you say, oh, well, look, that just pulls apart, because they just, they just cross over. But if you do GI twice, you just get something that's twisted up, like my braid. Okay? And so, you can't do anything if it is what it is. Okay. But one thing that's nice, so this braid relation here actually holds in the braid group. So, you might think that um, these guys commuting or these guys having this three-term product is something special, but it, it actually happens over here. So if you actually draw it out <coughs> um, with overcrossing, it'll work. Do you want to see it drawn out? Okay, people that before. Exercise. Draw it out yourself. Um, and I should say, so the braid group is, you know, it arises in nature, not just by drawing these pictures and seeing that you have these relations. You can get it from topology, right? You can take an appropriate hyperplane arrangement. Um, and then, well, if you just start with the naive one and you take pi one, the fundamental group, you get the pure braid, braid group. But if you actually say, oh, I have this extra action of a group, you pull it out by that and you take the fundamental group, then you'll get the braid group. Okay. So, um, I'm just going to skip writing something down for that, but if people have more questions later. Actually, there's better experts than I in the audience about thinking about the braid group as coming from the I want if I'm not to do. Okay. Um, so, and of course, the symmetric group also, using W, right, it occurs as the vial group coming from, say, GLN or FLN. So if you think of them as n by n permutation matrices, um, that's another place um, where it occurs in nature. Okay, and so, all right, so the symmetric group, what's important about it is that it acts on various nice spaces. And I'm actually not going to talk um, today, I don't think, about you know all the irreducible representations, young diagrams, young tableau, all of that. I sort of, I'm hoping that people are familiar with that, but I'm not gonna go into it. I'm gonna start with some much more basic things that it acts on. Well, okay. So, well, it acts on the set one through n, which I'll write sort of brackets n, well, by commuting them. But it's also nice to stick this n inside of the integers and have it act n periodically. Right? 
So when I say it acts on one through n, that's saying, oh, I think of this si as swapping i and n plus one, and writing this picture. Uh, if I'm acting on v peri n periodically, so that means that si is going to swap, well, okay, yeah, you swap i and i plus one, but you also swap everything um, down the road. And so, um, right, if you were to draw a picture, so, well, you'd have to sort of have your number line, and you'd have to swap i and i plus one. Um, repeating over and over again. If that gets a bit old, you might want to just write, um, sort of just think of this as one fundamental domain core, just think it gets repeated over and over again, or you might want to actually just put it itself on a cylinder and just think it wraps around and then kind of keep track of, you know, what's seen here is 1 and 1 plus n and 1 plus 2n and so on. Um, periodic, it's no harm to draw it on a cylinder. Um, and again, that way of thinking of things is going to come back as we move down our article. Um, another thing that we want to think of it acting on is Rn, or even, you know, Fn for some field, um, by just permuting coordinates, right? So, um, Si will just swap in the I plus first. <laughs> And that is a reflection over the hyperplane, you know, xi minus xj is zero. Um, all right. So another thing uh, that we might want to do with Sn is look at. Uh, so-called parabolic subalgebras of it. Um, so if J is some subset of my indices, right, I could write WJ for just the subgroup generated by just those transformations. Okay. And you might also have heard of young subgroup. So I might say the word sub parabolic subgroup or parabolic subalgebra, and I might sometimes, when I have my Conway Forest hat on, I might say young subgroup. And so what's going on? What do I mean? I'll just show you on an example. So let's say n is 7. J is a two, three, six. Okay, so then by WJ, I mean, right, you get to sort of, I'll write it this way, um, right? One has to go to itself, but you permute two and three and four. Five has to, yeah, five has to go to itself, but you get to permute six and seven because that's what your SI do. And so I could just write that as S1312. Okay, and so beta is my composition. 1312. You know, it's a bunch of numbers that add up to 7. Okay, and it's ordered. It doesn't have to be a partition. I don't have to be 2, 1, 1. Okay, so when I write it this way, I think young subgroup. When I write it the other way, I think parabolic, so I think about picking out the certain generators, or then I right, take the group generated by S2, S3, and S6, and you should be able to go back and forth between um, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Okay, we've got 2 and 3, provide some 3 there, and then 6 and 7, and that's how we end up 7. Okay, that's how we get the composition. And so, um, why talk about these parabolic subgroups? Well, we're going to you know, soup it up later. Can but. You, can you distinguish 
Yes, they are different subgroups, but they're all conjugate to each other, right? So yeah, so that's um, so. Let's notice that S one three one two. It's not the same as S three two one one or any reordering. They're not equal, but they are isomorphic. They're conjugate to each other. And they have conjugates that don't that are not young subgroups. You could conjugate by something weird, and we'll okay, you still get some subgroup. Um, so that was interesting. But when we move to Pekka algebras, we pair um, the conjugation in a group is, is a great thing. Um, but in the symmetric group, we have a notion of length, and we pair about. So this is this notation, and this is yeah. the heat that's called the seven. This uh, notation, say again? This notation, I don't know how to pronounce it. Oh, 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 this. this uh, so this is means yeah. it's a composition of. No. Uh, what? Partition, so it's not partition. if I wrote 3, 2, 1, 1, I would use a D. So my notation for is a partition of, is this D dash, uh -huh. is a partition of, and this notation is, is a composition of. And the composition is what again? It's just uh, it's just a um, a it's couple right. of positive numbers that add up to seven. Yeah, Thank you. Just ordered. Yeah. Combinatory groups might say a weak composition even allows zeros in there. Yeah. Uh, yes. No. Please ask when I don't define the hand. So let me write bold one for the trivial representation. And I'm going to use the bold ones a lot of times when a trivial representation makes sense. And it might not always be the same exact one, but it's always going to be in the trivial representation. Right? So the trivial representation. So for instance, and I'm going to use that loosely in whatever context I want. So, for instance, if I write bold one for my parabolic subgroup WJ, what do I mean? I mean the one dimensional representation, let's say, you know, whatever field you're working over F, but span by one vector such that all of your for all of J and J. So all of your generators are acting trivially. Um, or if you want, that is actually minus one. So it's a zero vector. Okay. And so, well, one reason why we care about parabolic subalgebras is they give us a way of building up representations as you know, in algebra, right, it's often useful to go to um, go to smaller, easier things, deal with them on a smaller, easier level, and then build up bigger things from them. So, for instance, something that's going to be important to understand is induce this representation of. And what is that, and what do you get? So, when I say induce, I always am going to mean tensor product. So, oops. Uh, and you know, we can really think today that F is a complex number, but whatever field we're working over. Right, so by induce, I always mean do this relative tensor product. And, you know, uh, how big is this? How do you think about it? What's the basis? How do you write these things down? These are things that I'm hoping you know, but I'm sort of reminding you of. Okay. So on the one hand, one way we can think about this right, is just a permutation representation on the left process. If it's a left action, I like left actions. Okay. Um, so this is right. Permutation representation. 
him. On my left cosec, begin to perform. And so in this example, right, if I said, what's the dimension of it going to be, you're just going to get a multinomial coefficient, 7 factorial over 1 factorial, 2 factorial, 1 factorial, 2 factorial. And I like to put my 1s in there, even though you might think, I don't need to have the 1s. It really is a good placeholder. Sorry, could you yeah. say, you, you chose the number 7 and then yeah. the subset J, yeah. and then how did you read off? Ah, how did I read these off? Which is, um, I just think to myself, so I have S2, so I don't have S1, right? I don't have S1, one stands alone. I have S2 and S3, and S2 and S3, you know we're going to swap 2 and 3 and 3 and 4, so I don't put any breaks in there, because I know 2 and 3 will mix these guys all up. I don't have, oh, so could, could that? I don't, yeah, so, so really, so ah, S the breaks three. are the, the breaks are the missing I's. Right? So we don't have S1, so I put the bar after S1. We don't have S4, I put the bar after S4. We don't have S5, I put the bar after S5. So these, these bars are the gaps, are the missing SI. And if you think about it, the subgroup <coughs> generated by taking S2. Combinatorially, the missing eyes are these bars, and then you do the composition by saying how big are each of the connected components. One, three, one, two. Great. Um, yes. So if so, basically, if you wanted a nice basis of this space, so the best basis to take are well any coset representatives would do, but the minimal length coset representatives are sort of the best, and as I mentioned, we care about length. So length. The length, how many people need a review of length? Talks about length. Okay. So let me say, so so let's see. So the basis, so people often will put a superscript on the super J with the set of minimal length. And you know, maybe the J should be on the left side for the left, but anyhow, left. Coset representative. So give so I said that these SIs generated a symmetric group. I just claim that without justifying it. Um, but you know it makes sense if you have a bubble sorted, you can get any permutation by just doing the adjacent permutation. And so the length of a word is the minimal um, number of generators you need to express. So I have a particular permutation. There's some way I can write as a word in the generator, and if L is minimal, then we say L is the length of W. Work that they were homogeneous, right? A word of length two is a word of length two, a word of length three is a word of length three. Um, it turns out that any, you know, any two minimal length um, expressions can be gotten to by doing a series of brave moves of doing, you know, swapping things that you can or changing one, two, ones into two, one, threes and two, two, twos into three, two, threes and so on and so forth. You'll actually get a good connected graph. Um, so, so, and it turns out if what you put here is going to be a parabolic subgroup and you say let's look at a coset of it, there's a unique representative in there of minimal length. So if I say take minimal length coset representative, there aren't going to be two different choices. There's going to be a unique one in there of minimal length and it's going to have the property that when you multiply it by anything in the subgroup, the length is always going to go up and in fact the lengths are always going to be added. 
Is it the same as not involving the days? No, no, you could think it's the same as not involving the J's, but it's not. So, for example, if we took, um, let's say, not n equals 7, let's take, you know, say n equals 4, and let's say j, let's let j be 2, 3. Uh, yeah, 2, 3. And so then, what are my minimal length posts that represented it? So, you know, we've got, um, well, we've got the identity. Certainly you have S1, because S1 isn't in there, but you've also got S2, S1. And you've also got S3, S2, S1. Okay. Um, and then you can check I have them all, because of course, right, four factorial, Remember the you have n minus one generators for Fn and you have n factorial for those n. Um, so certainly if you write out one of these minimal length POSA representatives and you and you write out a reduced word for it, I call these reduced words. Reduced words, reduced expressions. Whatever transposition sits on the right has to be in the complement of J. But then what precedes it in the prefix, you can see lots of other stuff. And you can check if you multiply by S2 or S3, or any, you know, anything in here, any of the six guys in here, always is gonna, it's always gonna add the, like the length to it. So if you want, um, there's a nice book by Humphreys on Coxeter, Blue and something, something, um, and Hill and Knights. They do it for all types, not just type A, but these kind of Coxeter and Knights things, but are not specialists. Um, all right, so right. So this is something, um, the basis of it, understanding that you have minimal length posts that represent it, this is going to come back to us again in more complicated situations. Induction, adjoint to induction is restriction. Okay, and restriction is easy, right? Induction is complicated, tensor product. Restriction is often easy if you can understand it. But you might not remember what happens when you combine induction and restriction. So let's say we took a representation of a parabolic such group WJ. Trivial is easy if you can put any representation up there. You can juice it up. Okay, it's dimension growth by multinomial coefficient. Then restrict it to some other parabolic and see what you get. Okay, and in fact, um, well, so one way that you can think about it is it's going to be still this permutation representation on the coset, but now you're restricting the action to just this other parabolic subgroup W pair. And the orbits are just going to correspond to double cosets. <coughs> right, so you might remember when you first learned algebra, you're like, okay, cosets, I got that, and double cosets, you're like, double cosets. Double cosets are so weird, they don't have to all be the same size. Like, why do you ever want double cosets? This is why you want double cosets, to tell induction and restriction play with each other. And so, um, we have this Mackey formula, a Mackey decomposition, that you can write restrict induce as a sum of induced restricts. Uh, let me just take my field to be the complexes so I can put a direct sum there. Okay. Although, actually, maybe the symmetric group. I can get away with any field. Um, you can write the sum of uh, restrict induces. And so what are you restricting to and what are you doing um, your inductions for? Well, in the end, right, this is how I remember it. 
Um, we're ending up with representations of one subgroup WK, so I must be inducing up to WK. So you must be going from uh, some subgroup that sits inside there. Well, it's WK intersect with some conjugate of my WJ. And then, well, you're restricting from WJ to a subgroup of WJ. Well, it turns out it's sigma inverse WK or sigma intersect with WJ. Okay. Well, restrict your trivial, it's still the trivial, it doesn't matter. And you're like, wait a minute, I restricted to a different subgroup that I'm inducing up from. Well, you use the sigma to twist it. And where does sigma come from? Sigma R, your minimal length coset representative. Minimal length double coset representatives. Okay. Right, in other words. Um, so before, when we had our, just our permutation representation, and we just cared about a basis, we were looking at these minimal length left coset representatives. When you restrict it down, right, you, the sum just goes over the double coset representative. And so that's just digging up from your undergraduate algebra something. But, you know, uh, I never really cared about double cosets until I was playing conduction and okay. what So, what does they mean? What does what mean? This? Oh, sorry, no, no, no. Range, ranges over the minimum length double coset representative. Yeah. And what's so, it's, so if you're going to be playing with reduction and restriction in settings that have to do with eventually double affine half algebra, right? We're going to produce representations by inducing up other representations, and we're going to understand them by restricting them down to sub algebras. And so we're going to want have some kind of matching theorem that writes them as something easier to do to restrict. And this should be easier because this is going to be something smaller. Okay. And then the important thing to remember is yes, you can do it, but that these double coset representatives enter the picture, so you have to know and love and understand them. And you want them in a length one. And the fact that there's this twisting that happens. Okay. So this from this subgroup, this subgroup here, I just conjugate by. And so you basically just, uh, it's the same underlying vector space, and then how are your elements acting? You just conjugate them by sigma, okay. and then you get the action. Is there a nice independent meter right there? Well, actually, I did say you should take the minimal length coset representative. I could have just taken any double coset representative, it would have been fine. Even the sigma? Um, even the sigma twisting would be fine if it wasn't minimal length. It would be okay. Yeah, you could just sum over double cosets. But um, I like to pick my representative to be minimal length now because it's going to matter later. But yeah, in the group situation, it actually wouldn't matter. Because of course, this is a more general, I mean, this isn't something just about the symmetric group. It's for any finite group and to give you two subgroups of it, you can write the same formula in any, coset, any double coset representative you want. So it's just some formal kind of. Uh, so you want to know why Mac? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so yeah, this is something that just works in you know finite group theory. It's, I mean, it really is just a permutation representation, and you just take your hands dirty with it and you just see it happening. And this is true for other representations as opposed to trivial ones. Like yes, and I could put anything there besides the trivial. It would also be a lot. The trivial. This formula simplifies a lot. The formula becomes super easy because right the risk. Right, the restriction and you twist and twisting it, you don't see the twisting. Yeah, this one was super easy, but it's important to put it there for later on. Yeah. Something to do with, so you see K and K and J, right? So yeah, K and J are two. Yeah. And just sum over all elements from the double cost, or you just want to write them as in the minimal way. No, oh, no, 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 no. You only take one representative from each double cost set when you write this. Well, don't take the double. Oh, no. sorry. So you take the If you had some character formula for it, then you couldn't have resumed and given divided up it. So anyway, this formula will come back to us later. Are they are getting unique, like they were over there? Um, so yeah, so the question, so 
you could put any double crochet representatives here in the state would still be two. Um, but the minimal length double crochet representatives, yeah, are unique. When you're talking about this one, what it costs is. Yeah, not here. Does this also hold for infinite groups for the subgroup of finite in there? Oh, that's a good question. Um, you have to worry about this direct sum. So you have, to, yeah, you have like two subgroups of finite in there, so you actually make sure that the double crochet does have the finite in yeah, there. Yeah, so then if you're in, the reason I went to the complexes is because I would need them to be semi-simple and I can put the direct sum here. If you were, if you have an integer group and it was, um, yeah, it should work. It should work if you have an infinite group and two subgroups of finite in there. Yep, and the same for each of the two. Over two. If you're over two. If you're over two. Um, all right. So those are some of the basics about the symmetric group, the basic concepts and ideas that are going to appear over and over again. So now that I've told you what I want you to get out of the symmetric group, I need to generalize this in two different directions. So one is going to the affine setting, right? Because remember there was that double affine causality by the title. And then um, the other is I'm going to want a Q deform it or, well, maybe T deform it. Um, my parameter, I like Q deforming things like U cube, G, and so on, um, H cube, but some people use a T to deform it. When we doubly deform, when we get the double affine hand because it turns a Q and a T in there. And anyway, there's all these different parameters that you can use all over the place, and I might mess up and use Q when I need to. But we're going to deform. And of course, we're going to do both at the same time. So this is going right from symmetric to heca, just taking the deformation. And of course, we're taking half and heca, double half and heca. Okay. So and I'm going to do both and a doubly half line. I'm going to half line twice eventually. So let's start with the half line and be more classical today. <laughs> <laughs> and now this stuff I'm not sure how many people are going to be familiar with or not. So my notation will have a symmetric group sitting inside that have these quadratic and braid relations. So what I have in the middle is I throw in one extra generator, my so-called affine generator, and I'll still have my quadratic and braid relations. And in fact, there's a corresponding, you know, affine braid group that goes along with these. And this is this is sort of vanilla affine, and this is the so-called extended affine. But a lot of times, I'll just be lazy and forget the word extended. When I say affine, I'm almost always going to mean extended affine, which has one extra generator of pi in addition, which um, is a diagram automorphism, basically. So we have quadratic relations, braid relations, and sort of your pi relations and your diagram automorphism relations that come in. Okay. So, um, Let's talk about this new guy, this S0 for the moment. Well, I have the same old quadratic relation as before. It's a reflection, so it's squares to one. And I have my same old braid relation, right, where now S0 is now adjacent to Sn minus one. So I take my indices mod n. Okay. And I have erased it now, but I have all those nice things that SN acted on. Well, um, these guys all act on such things as well. So, right, so again, 
we can act on the integers n periodically. And so, you know, let's say, I don't know, n is 4. Right, so here's my 1, 2, 3, 4. That Sn just commutes around there and I would go periodically. So what does S0 do? It just, well, if S0, right, if S1 swaps 1 and 2 and S2 swaps 2 and 3, S0 should drop, should swap 0 and 1, right? There's no, nothing special about 0. But then, of course, you have to be um, periodic about it. Okay, and then, if you believe the old braid relations, you believe the new braid relations because zero is adjacent to one, but it's also adjacent to uh, n minus one and negative one and so on. And again, right, we could still stick this on a cylinder. So let's say, you know, here's your one and here's your n, and right, you're swapping, you're not swapping one and n going all the way across and crossing <coughs> strands, you're swapping one then around the back of the cylinder. Ah, this discussion of length that came up, I forgot to say. Sure, we can think of length as this reduced expression, but length is also, in a fundamental domain, the number of crossings that you see. So this still has length one. Yeah. Pi is just rotation of the Pi is just going to rotate. Yeah, so I did, did, I'll get to pi in a second. Um, right, so the SEO just does this, okay. Uh, what about if I'm looking on R to the N? What do you do? If I had F to the N before. Sure. Okay, so not um, a reflection to a subspin, right? It's not a reflection over a hyperplane that goes to the origin. It's a reflection over an affine hyperplane. And so this is part of where the word affine comes from, that you throw in an affine hyperplane that you're reflecting over. And, right, you can see this is not a linear operator. It's affine linear. Okay? So you, the nth guy comes up here, you add one, the first guy goes up to there. Um, so let's um, draw a picture. There is something about how you slice it with some hyperplane at some different height, and I just like, and then you can make it actually going through a plane that does go through that origin, but the plane where this is living isn't. And I, need to, I want to draw the picture right if I haven't drawn it ahead of time. But yeah, so if you study affine root systems, you see this. So, right, so n equals 2. instead of x and y axis, right? And so here's the line x1 minus x2 is 0. 
right? And S1 is just a reflection over this. Certainly, right, if I take something here and I say swap the X1 and X2 coordinates, it's just reflecting me over this line. And then where's S0? Maybe we'll call it a here. Right, my S0 is just right, this parallel hyperplane to it. <coughs> and, right, that say for what's been here, you know. One zero, so for instance, zero zero is going to come over here, so like one minus one, right? So if you actually take this formula to heart and you think about what happens, you can see it's the reflection over this parallel hyperplane. Okay. And so of course, then you can check that if you compose s zero with s one, right, you'll just get translation by So very often we try to cut ourselves down a dimension, right? I can see V inside of Fn to be things with coordinate sum zero. So basically the curve to one, 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 one. Okay, so it's basically the same as modding out by the vector one, 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 one. Um, and again, I'm drawing things in Rn. Um, so if we were living there, then we would just have zero. We cut ourselves down a dimension. S, so how do you cut down? You just take x1 minus x2 as your new coordinate, right? And then here's one, and s0 is reflecting you over one, as opposed to over zero. Um, and if we were in, well, how about I'll skip drawing the picture for any of this in, in the interest of time, but if anybody wants to see it, you know, we'll draw the picture for any of this okay. And then, yeah, and so what does pi do? Um, I pick pi to be the positive shift. Pi just adds one to everything in sight. And you can check that that is n periodic, right? No matter what n is. So, pi is just d, d, d. Careful with how I do, draw things. So, up till now, none of my strands had any orientation on them. And uh, you know, when I drew these pictures, I forgot to say, right, how do you compose? You just stack on top of each other. But I need to tell you, am I stacking top to bottom or bottom to top if I'm composing right to left and left to right? And um, it hasn't mattered up till now, but now it's going to matter. And I think I decided for how I'm drawing my pictures that my arrows are going down. So if I'm if I'm drawing a picture of pi, I'm going to draw it shifting that way. And I hope that is consistent with what I have later on. And again, so if you're on the cylinder, right, everything just moves around. Yeah. Uh, and so drawing pi is not an easy thing. It's not something I prepared to do. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna draw it on this picture. I'm just gonna work here or here and say what's happening. Okay. Um, and it yeah, if you try to draw pi there, it does something really strange indeed. Um, and you meant setting that in the experimentation because that's what the relations are. I mean in um I'm sorry, what's the question? I mean what are the Oh yeah, what are yeah. the so yeah, so now that I've told you what pi is, now I can tell you the new relations that involve pi. But yeah, you can you can see it's pretty clear that well pi has infinite order. There's nothing. There's no relation on pi itself, and pi of course is going to conjugate an si into an si plus one. And again, we take indices mod n. So 
because we have a wrap around from this end minus one plus zero. Um, and um, oops, I didn't write it down in terms of vectors of what you would be doing, but it is, um, let's see if I can do it correctly. I have it later on in my notes. Pi is going to take a1 to a n, and it's going to, uh, so it's shifting everything down. Upstairs here, you'll have a plus one. Right, so it shifts. In. So notice that SC, all of the SIs preserve the sum of the coordinates. Right, so for instance, if I live in this space D where the coordinates sum to zero, I'm okay with all the SIs. Pi breaks that and you just added one. Okay, so I don't. Um, and another way to see that when you draw the pictures, right, all of your SIs, okay, they might leave this particular fundamental domain, but as much edges that flow out of it also flow in, there's like something net preserved. When you do pi, there's not. There's some net flow in or out. And by how much tells you how many powers of pi you're up to. Okay. Um, so... So, so this this spectrum of z is it faithful? Oh, yeah. And and uh, in here, do you take pi n equals one? No. No, I see. No, that's a different feature. And um, I had mentioned I'm doing everything in type A, and in fact, even like in type GL, that's kind of part of not having this extra relation of pi to the n. One that would, if you're looking at like type SL or type PPL, um, when you get the things right, then you'll want to do that. But yeah, I'm not putting that. Um, so actually, let's so geometrically using this picture, right? The fact that S0, S1 is a translation, um, it makes sense, right? <coughs> Acting on Z, what does it mean that it's a translation? All right, what happens? Uh, you know, if you look at 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on, let's just take, let's take with n equals 2 in the picture there, right? So what happens, right? So, right, S1 swaps 1 and 2, but then what does S0 do? Right, swaps 1 and 0, and then you have to do that periodically. So another way of, you know, all of your odd numbers decrement and all of your even numbers increment. Um, and so on and so forth. And then you can think of three is just one plus two times one, and zero is just two plus two times minus one. So what does a translation mean when you act on Z and periodically? How do you recognize a translation? A translation means something that's one mod n goes to something that's one mod n. Something that's two mod n goes to something that's two mod n. And then that means you must be multi adding some multiple of n. What's that multiple of n that you're adding? Oh, look, one minus one. Would it be translate by the vector one minus one? So that's what your translation becomes. Um, all right, and again, I have an example worked out for n equals three, which I will skip in the interest of time. Okay. Ah. So, of course, we had all of our old permutations, and we have them n periodically, and now, um, oh, and I should say, <clears throat> if we take the si and pi, that will give me all n periodic permutations from z to z. Right? It might not be clear that you get all of them, but if you believe you can get any permutation by double sorting derivatives and stuff, you should actually believe that. 
Um, so there's some new elements I'm going to call xi that what is xi going to do? Well, it's going to look like the identity on everything but i. I'm going to send i to i plus n and then periodize that. Okay. So if we were on the cylinder, here's i. Right, so it's taking this and it's wrapping i around exactly once in the positive direction. And so that's, again, it matters that I decided that I'm having my arrows go that way. And my words are that way. But then other than that, right, everything else just comes straight down. So you just got to wrap a single number around. Okay, and then you can check that if you take the product of x1, x2, xn, that's chi at the end, because everything will have wrapped around exactly one full time. Chi just shifts everything by one. So you do chi n times for everything else that makes a resolution. Um, and it should be also pretty clear that pi conjugates an xi to an xi plus one. So, all right. Okay. What time am I ending? Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So, ah, and um, you have a map from the extended affine Kafka algebra just to SN by filling in the cylinder. Right, you sort of, sort of fill in the cylinder, or in other words, you ignore the winding number, you just take the underlying permutation. So for instance, all of these xi's are in the kernel of that map. Because Right? The strand started at I, it ended in I. That's the identity map. You don't see that there was a big hole in the cylinder you fill it in. Um, okay. So, I think, um, I will have to reorganize my lecture later, but let me just say that My finite Hecke algebra of type A. Okay, so we affinize the symmetric group now, we want to deform it. So, excuse me, so mm -hmm. this really means sigma 0 goes to 1, right? And sigma 0 goes to 1 or not? Sigma 0. S, S0? Sorry, S0 goes to no, 1. No, S0 will swap 1 and N. So, so what is this map? This is so S0 S, goes... S0, right, so notice S0 swaps 1 and N around the back side of the cylinder. This map says forget the fact that there's a cylinder there, just read the indices on the top and see the permutation that they go to on the bottom. So and, and pi goes through. to... And, and pi also goes to pi a side, has a cycle. To, a, to an N cycle. Okay. Pi goes to an N cycle. So one that's, goes that's to the two, map. 2 goes to 3, three to that N drops back to 1 as opposed to N plus 1. <laughs> so, I'll just put up the generators and relations and you can think about it um, later on. So we'll take, take capital T1 through Tn minus 1. We'll still have the braid relations, but now I'm putting in a new quadratic relation, which is Ti minus little t, Ti plus little t inverse is zero, and so this parameter t is some invertible element in my field. Okay. So remember, I factored my quadratic relation before for the symmetric group, si minus one, si plus one plus zero. So at t equals one, you get the same old quadratic relation, you're gonna get the group algebra of the symmetric group. 
Um, this is a quotient of the grade group. Right? We wrote those GIs for um, the things that you twist and twist and twist. What this is saying is that, okay, if you have such a grade and you do it twice, oh no, this you can write it out in terms of some linear combination of things with fewer twists in it, fewer crossing. So you do have over and under crossing, um, and they're different from each other, but they're not too different. And so in the next time, I'll have to say, OK, all of these pictures that we drew, we can draw them again, having this little T in there or differentiating over crossing from under crossing. And then we'll put it all together, affine plus over under crossing. And then we'll get to double affine when it's the same. OK. This T here is fixed, or? Yeah, you fix the T as a parameter. And then we get, okay, yeah, that's the HN based off our T. And then are there relations that we're guessing? Like we have like a relation over the T's that would give us relations among the head down numbers? Oh, yeah. So you're saying, like, what if I have a head to algebra? That takes one point to the other. Will there then, if we look at their corresponding head to algebra, will there be something that reflects that? So let me say that when t is not a root of unity, this algebra is semi-simple. So it's a product of matrix algebras. Isomorphic to the group that, oh, it depends what your underlying field is. So let's say we're over the complexes. We'll just get the group algebra with symmetric groups. So most of the time, they'll all look the same with each other, and they'll be semi-simple. They'll be quite different when you put in a root of unity. But they're not isomorphic in a nice way. Yeah, they're isomorphic in a weird way. They're, the way you see they're isomorphic is you say it's semi-simple, it's a product of matrix algebra, it's a product of matrix algebra, it's fine. Yeah, I just explicitly writing it down in terms of generators in relation to this is quite nasty. Yeah, that's not Listing has kind of changed. No, 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 I didn't get credit for that. Yeah, yeah, question. So what can you say about this extension? So as we just saw, S0 and pi really already exist in this metric group. Uh, well, they, they, they don't, I mean, if you think of the symmetric group as just kind of living on a disk, one through n, they don't. You really have to go to the cylinder and put this hole in the cylinder before you can see S0 and pi. I mean, there is the interpretation of 1 and n already exists. This map has a big kernel. Oh, yeah. Not oh, sure oh. it has a big kernel. Yeah, I mean, this map, yeah. The map. And what can you say about it? Sort of oh, what can place? you say about the kernel? Yeah. I think it's generated by the SI. Oh. Yeah. Right. Because right, this is kind of the simplest thing that you can do that's not the identity, but it becomes the identity in the map. Right. A single I increments I of n to this one I. Um, yeah. This also, this kernel and what's going on, it should kind of a repeat.